so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. <clears throat> For Mrs. Lovett. What a dull, insipid thing is a love letter written in cold blood after the heat of the business is over. <laughs> it is a tax upon good nature, which I have here been laboring to pay and have done it, but will have the same fate I know that all my notes to her have had of late, will not be thought kind enough. Faith. Women are in the right when they jealously examine our letters, for in them we always first discover our decay of passion. Oof. What noise is that? Hey, Andy! You called, sir. What vermin is that chattering without? Foggy Nan, sir, the uh, orange woman. <laughs> Go call in that overgrown jade with the flasket of guts before her. Fruit is refreshing in the morning. <laughs> ah, how now, double tripe? What news do you bring? News? Here's the best fruit has come to town this year. Gad, I was up before four o'clock this morning and bought all the choice in the market. Mm, the nasty refuse of your shop. Uh, you need not make mouths at it. I assure you, tis all excellent where? The citizens buy better on a holiday and their walk to Tottenham. Good or bad, tis all one. <laughs> I never knew you'd praise anything when you could mock it instead. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> would the ladies had heard you talk of him as I have done? Oh, God's my life, I'd almost forgot to tell you. There is a young gentlewoman lately come to town with her mother that is so taken with you. Hmm, is she handsome? <laughs> Gad, there are few finer women, I tell you, sir. And a hugest fortune, they say. Here, eat this peach. I wager tis better than any you have tried. It tastes like soil and degradation. You're very welcome for it, Mr. Handy. That'll be a hay penny. <sighs> this uh, fine woman, I'll lay my life, is some awkward, ill-fashioned thing who, not having above four dozen coarse hairs on her head, has adorned her baldness with a large white frizz and can speak no more than two languages on an empty stomach. <laughs> Egad, you'd change your note quickly if you did but see her. Mm. How came she to know me? She saw you yesterday at the exchange. She told me you came and fooled with the woman at the next shop. I remember there was a mask observed me indeed. I Wait, fooled, did you say? <laughs> I, I vow she told me 20 things you said, too, and acted with her voice and with her body so like you that she may have charged admission for the parody. <laughs> Dormant, my life, my joy, my darling sin. Mwah, mwah. How dost thou? Lord, what a filthy trick these men have got of kissing one another. Why do you suffer this cartload of scandal to come near you and make your neighbors think you so improvident to need a bod? What has thou against bods, Mr. Medley? Nothing, but that they are as much out of fashion as... Your waistcoat, sir? Go to. You are an insignificant brandy bottle. Mm, nay, there you wrong her. Three quarts of canary is her business. Ugh, oh, what please you, gentlemen? Now come, Mr. Dormant, pay me for my fruit. Not a penny. When you bring the gentlewoman you spoke of hither to my house, you shall be paid. The gentlewoman? What gentlewoman? Nay, come and pay me, Mr. Dormant. Do not abuse me so. Tell me the lady's name, and Handy shall pay you. I must not. She forbid me. That's a sure sign she would have you, whoever she is. Where does she live? They lodge at my house. Nay, then she's in a hopeful way. What kind of woman's the mother? A goodly gentlewoman. Who thinks you an errant devil? A goodly judge of character, then. I warrant, should she see you, she would look to see if you had a cloven foot. Does she know me? Hm. 
only by hearsay. A thousand horrid stories have been told her of you, and she believes them all. By the character, this should be the famous Lady Woodville and her daughter, Harriet. The devil take him for guessing. <laughs> Do you know them? Both very well. The mother's a great admirer of the forms and civility of the last age. Hmm. Well, an antiquated beauty may be allowed to be out of humor at the freedoms of the present, but what of the daughter? Why, first she's an heiress, vastly rich. And handsome? Ooh. What alteration a 12 month may have bred in her, I know not, but a year ago she was considered the beautifulest creature in England. More hearsay. N nay, Gad, he tells you true. She's a delicate creature. Mm. Has she wit? More than is usual in her sex and as much malice. Then she's as wild as you would wish her and has a demureness in her looks that makes it so surprising. Flesh and blood cannot hear this and not long to know her. I wonder what makes her mother bring her up to town. She's a protective old bat. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, uh. Never question a miracle, Medley. It spoils the effect. Andy, see the lady out. Mr. Dormant. And give her 10 shillings. And madam, be sure you tell the young gentlewoman I must be acquainted with her. I will, you corset monger. <laughs> Heaven mend you for it. Farewell, Diana. Now, Dormit, when did you last see your pizole, as you call her, Mrs. Lovett? Not these two days. And how stand affairs between you? Fractured. I have been endeavoring to repair them. To disguise your wanderings, rather. Oh, I wonder how her mighty spirit bears it. Mm, badly, on all conscience. I never knew so violent a creature. Indeed, she's the most passionate in her love and the most extravagant in her jealousy of any woman I ever heard of. What paper is that? Uh, an excuse I'm going to send her for the neglect I am guilty of. Prithee, read it. No, but if you will take the pains, you may. <clears throat> I never was a lover of business. But now I have a just reason to hate it, since it has kept me these two days from seeing you. I intend to wait upon you in the afternoon and in the pleasure of your conversation, forget all I've suffered in this tedious absence. <laughs> ha! This business of yours, Dormant, has been with a new wizard at the playhouse. <laughs> I have had an eye on you. If some malicious spectator should betray you, this kind note would hardly make your peace with her. No, I desire no better. What? Why would her knowledge of it oblige you? That it might compel her to break off our understanding. You know, next to the coming to a good understanding with a new mistress, I love a quarrel with an old one. Thou art a damned self-immolating fellow, and is like to be hanged by the women as loved for thy qualities. But might I, perchance, forward this business myself? I'll about it presently, and though I know the truth of what you've done will set love it raving, I'll heighten it a little with invention, leave her in a fit of anger, and be here again before dinner time. Spare yourself the labor. The business is undertaken already by one who will manage it with more address and malice than you can. Who in the devil's name can this be? Why, the wizard. That very wizard you saw me with. Does she love mischief so well as to betray herself to spite another? Not so, neither, Medley. Rather, this mask for a farther confirmation of what I have been these two days swearing to her made me yesterday at the playhouse swear a promise to break off with Lovett and to ensure I follow through, has contrived a way to give me occasion. Very good. She intends about an hour before me this afternoon to make love it a visit and having the privilege of a professed friendship to talk of her concerns. 
Is she a friend? <laughs> An intimate friend. <gasps> better and better. Pray proceed. She means to initiate an unflattering discourse of my infidelity and raise love its jealousy to such a pitch that the woman shall fly upon me with all the fury imaginable as soon as I enter. And the quarrel being thus begun, I am to play my part, uh, confess and justify all my roguery, swear that her ill humor makes her intolerable, tax her with the next fop that comes into my head and in a huff, march away. Mm, this wizard is a spark and has a genius that makes her worthy of yourself, Doramond. Andy! Sir? Where are my clothes? In your dressing room, sir. In great. Why hast thou not brought them hither? Tis almost noon. Truly, sir, the day I wake up to find myself privileged with the knowledge of your worship's innermost thoughts, I swear I will be the model of industrious servitude. You see the joy of my existence. <clears throat> you have two options, Handy. You may bring the man his clothes or your head on a platter. I dare say he cares not which of the two he receives. I do not. Well, that's your lordship wishes. Where shall we dine today? Where you will. Ah, here comes a good third man. Harry! Your servant, gentlemen. I pray you, grant me your pardon for my neglect of late. Though you've made us miserable by the want of your good company, to show you I am free from all resentment, may the beautiful cause of our misfortune give you all the joys happy lovers have shared ever since the world began. You wished me in heaven, but you believe me on my journey to hell. You have a good, strong faith, Belair, and that may contribute much towards your salvation. I confess I am but of an untoward constitution, apt to have doubts and scruples, and in love, these are no less distracting than in religion. Were I so near marriage, I should cry out by fits as I ride in my coach, cuckold, cuckold, with no less fury than the mad fanatic cries out, glory in bedlam. Because religion makes some run mad, must I live an atheist? I, an atheist, a sinner. Tis the only way to avoid the inevitable insanity of a long devotion. Preach no more on this text. I am determined and there is no hope of my conversion. Pox on thee, Handy! Leave thy unnecessary fiddling! A wasp that buzzing about a man's nose at dinner is not more troublesome than thou art. You love to have your clothes hang just so, sir. I love to be well dressed, sir, and think it no scandal to my understanding. Away. Tis a mighty pretty suit of yours, Dormant. I'm glad it has your approbation. No man in town has a better fancy in his clothes than you have. But I hear there is a great critic in these matters, lately arrived, piping hot from Paris. Sir Fopling Flutter, you mean? The same. He thinks himself the pattern of modern gallantry. He is indeed the pattern of modern foppery. He was yesterday at the play with a pair of gloves up to his elbows and a periwig more exactly curled than a lady's head newly dressed for a ball. And his tongue full of Francais. Oh, but how else is he supposed to let us know he met people of quality at King Louis Garth? He has been, as the sparkish word is, brisk upon the ladies already. He was yesterday at my Aunt Townley's and gave Mrs. Lovett a catalog of his good qualities under the character of a complete gentleman who, according to Sir Fopling, ought to dress well, dance well, fence well, have a genius for love letters, an agreeable voice for a chamber, be very amorous, something discreet, but not overconstant. <laughs> Pretty ingredients to make an accomplished person. I am glad he pitched upon Lovett. Why? I wanted a fop to lay at her charge, and here's one dropped from the heavens. From Calais, you mean? <laughs> I am confident Mrs. Lovett loves no man but you. But hark you, torment. Oh, with your leave, Mr. Medley, tis only a secret concerning a fair lady. Your good breeding, sir, gives you too much trouble. 
You might have whispered without all this ceremony. How stand your affairs with Belinda of late? She's a little jilting baggage. But she was with you yesterday in disguise at the play. Well, there we fell out and resolved never more to speak to one another. The occasion? Eh, want of courage to meet me at the place appointed. But these young women apprehend loving as much as the young men do fighting at first. But once entered, they all turn bullies straight. Sir, your men without desires to speak with you. Gentlemen, I'll return immediately. A very pretty fellow, this. Yeah, he's handsome. Well bred, and by much the most tolerable of all the young men that do not abound in wit. Mm. But what was that whisper? A thing which he would fain have known, but I did not think it fit to tell. It might have frighted the young Lancelot from his honorable intentions of marrying. Give Amelia her due. She has the best reputation of any young woman about the town who has beauty enough to provoke detraction. Her carriage is unaffected, her discourse modest, and her wit a degree or two above adequate. She's a discreet maid, and I believe nothing can corrupt her but a husband. A husband? Yes, a husband. You know, I have known many women make a difficulty of losing a maidenhead who have afterwards made none of a cuckold. It may be she loves him, too. It may be the sun shines in the summer, but what will it do in January? Hmm? Ah, dear Belair, by heavens, I thought we had lost thee. Dormant, I am undone. My man has brought the most shocking news in the world. <gasps> so strange misfortune has befallen your love. <gasps> My father came to town last night and lodges in the very house where Amelia lies. Does he know it is with her you are in love? He knows I love, but knows not whom unless some officious sot has betrayed me. Your Aunt Townley is your confidant and favors the business. I do not apprehend any ill office from her. I have received a letter in which I am commanded by my father to meet him at my aunt's this afternoon. He tells me farther that he has made a match for me and bids me resolve to be obedient to his will or expect to be disinherited. Now's your time, Belair. Never had lover such an opportunity of giving a generous proof of his passion. As how? Why, hang the estate, marry Amelia out of hand, and provoke your father to do what he threatens. What need have you of money when you have the she, whom you have sworn to us on so many swooning occasions you happily would die for? I could find in my heart to resolve not to marry at all. Oh, fie, fie! That would spoil a good jest and disappoint the well-natured town of an occasion of laughing at you. The storm I have so long expected. Fear not, sir. Thy wig will keep it dry. Where do you dine? At Long's. Or Lockett's. At Long's, let it be. I'll run and see Amelia and inform myself how matters stand. If my misfortunes are not so great as to make me unfit for company, I'll be with you. How did you come, Medley? In a chair. You may have hackney coach if you please, sir. I may ride the elephant if I please, sir. Call another chair, Handy, and let my coach follow it along. I was afraid, Amelia, all had been discovered. I tremble with the apprehension still that my brother should take lodgings in the very house where you lie. T'was lucky we had timely notice to warn the people to be secret. He seems a mighty good-humored old man. He ever had a notable smirking way with him. He calls me rogue tells me he can't abide me and does so berate me. On my word, you are much in his favor then. He has been very inquisitive. I am told about my family, my reputation and my fortune. I am confident he does not in the least suspect you are the woman his son's in love with. 
what should make him then inform himself of me? What should make him then inform himself so particularly of me? It may be he has a doting fit upon him. Who knows? It cannot be. Here comes my nephew. Well, Harry, where did you leave your father? Writing a note within. Amelia, this early visit looks as if some kind jealousy would not let you rest at home. The knowledge I have of my rival gives me a little cause to fear your constancy. My constancy? I vow. Ah, ah, ah. Do not vow. Our love is frail as is our life and full as little in our power. Pray, what has passed between you and your father in the garden? He's firm in his resolution, tells me I must marry Miss Harriet or swears he'll marry himself and disinherit me. When I saw I could not prevail with him to be more indulgent, I dissembled in obedience to his will, which has composed his passion and will give, and will give us time and, I hope, opportunity to deceive him. Peace. Here he comes. Harry, take this and let your man carry it for me to Mr. S to Mr. Forbes's chamber, my lawyer in the temple. Madam Amelia, <laughs> my dod, I am glad to see thee here. Make much of her, sister. She's one of the best of your acquaintance. I like her countenance and her behavior well. She has a modesty that is not common in her age, but don't she has. I know her value, brother, and esteem her accordingly. Advise her to wear a little more mirth in her face. She, don't she's too serious. The fault is very excusable in a young woman who lives in this world. <laughs> Nay, a dod I like her never the worse, for a melancholy beauty has her charms. Methinks you speak very feelingly, brother. I am but five and fifty, sister, an age not altogether insensible. Cheer up, Daisy, loosen a smile. I have a secret to tell thee, may chance to make thee merry. A secret, sir? We twain will make collation together and on. Ha <laughs> um, Though, if it, you are a little rogue and I can't abide you. Ah, Harry, come there. Must along with me to my lady Woodville's. Uh, see, ladies. A uh, wife is no curse when she would state with her, but an idle town flirt with a painted face and a rotten reputation, and Dot is the devil and all. And such a one I hear you are in league with. There is no poison like false gossip. Except or true gossip. Except true gossip, sir, to the ear of his sovereign lord and father. Remember my secret, Amelia, ye rogue, and <laughs> I will tell thee anon. Uh, sister, fare you well. And don't dawdle, Harry, come along. On my word, the old man comes on apace. I'll lay my life, he's smitten. Oh, no, I can't think it. This is nothing but the giddiness of his humor. I know my brother better than you, but let him flirt. It may prove useful. Madam, uh, Mr. Medley has sent to know whether a visit would be troublesome this afternoon. Send him word his visits are never so. Dear Medley, he's a very pleasant man. Uh, he's a very necessary man among us women. He's not scandalous in the least, perpetually contriving to bring good company together and always ready to fill a place at the card table. And he knows all the newest intrigues of the town. Mr. Medley. Your servant, Lady Townley. You have made yourself a stranger of late. I believe you took a surfeit of card playing last time you were here. 
Indeed, I had my belly full of that termagant lady dealer. The old Gleeker was insatiable. Pray, where's your friend, Mr. Dormant? Soliciting his affairs. He's a man of great employment and has more mistresses now pending than the most eminent lawyer in England has cases. Here has been Mrs. Lovett, so uneasy and out of humor these few days. How strangely love and jealousy rage in that poor woman. She could not have picked out a devil upon earth so proper to torment her. Dormant has made her break a dozen or two fans already. Leave your raillery, sir, and tell us. Is there any new wit come forth? Songs or novels? Hmm, a very pretty piece of gallantry called The Art of Affectation, written by a late beauty of quality, teaching you how to draw up your breasts, <laughs> to play with your head, to toss up your nose, to bite your lips, to speak in a silly soft tone and use all the French words that will infallibly make your person and conversation charming. Ah, charmant as it were. Bien sûr, mademoiselle. Shall I send you a copy? No, indeed, Mr. Medley. I find myself sufficiently charming without the advice of an old relic who would teach me how to transform myself into a Paris peacock and all for the fruitless sake of desirability. Enough of this prattle. You must, sir, give us an account of the state of love as it now stands in London. Truly, there have been some revolutions in those affairs. Great chopping and changing among the old, and some new lovers whom malice, indiscretion, and misfortune have luckily brought into play. What think you of walking into the next room and sitting down before you engage in this business? I wait upon you, ladies, and dare promise a plenty of scandal. <sighs> Pert, madam. I hate myself. I look so ill today. Hate to the wicked cause of it. That base man, Mr. Dormant, who makes you torment and vex yourself continually. He is to blame, indeed. But to blame? Oh, to be two days without sending, riding, or coming near you, contrary to his oath and covenant? Oh, Tis impossible for a man of his inconstant temper to be faithful, I'm sure. I know Dormant's a devil, but, oh, he has something of the angel yet undefaced in him, which makes him so charming and agreeable that I must love him, be he never so wicked. I little thought, madam, to see your spirit tamed to this degree. You, who banished poor Mr. Lackwit, but for taking up another lady's fan in your presence, and Mr. Wagfan for smiling at a housemaid. <laughs> my knowing of such odious fools contributes to my loving adornment the better. <laughs> Your knowing of Mr. Dormant should rather make you hate all mankind. So it does. All mankind. Hmm, besides himself. Pray, what excuse does he make in his letter? He has had business. <laughs> oh, a modish man is always very busy when he is in pursuit of a new mistress. Oh! Some devil has bribed you to rail at him. He had business, I will believe it, and will forgive him. You may forgive him anything, but I shall never forgive him for making it his business to defame you. I had rather be made infamous by dormant than owe my reputation to the dull discretion of those fops you talk of. Hmm. Belinda. My dear. You have been unkind of late. <laughs> Say unkind, say unhappy. Where have you been these two days? Oh, my dear, I have been so tired with two or three country gentlewomen whose conversation has been more insufferable than a country fiddle. Are they relations? No, Welsh acquaintance I made when I was last year at St. Winifred's. They have asked me a thousand questions of the modes and intrigues of the town. <laughs> and I have told them almost as many things for news that hardly were so when their gowns were in fashion. <laughs> Provoking creatures. How could you endure them? 
Now to carry on my plot, nothing but love could make me capable of so much falsehood. <laughs> oh, I was yesterday at a play with them where I was fain to show them the living as the man at Westminster does the dead. That is Mrs. Such a One admired for her beauty. This is Mr. Such a One cried up for a wit. And there sits fine Mrs. Such a One who was lately cast off by my Lord Such a One. Did you see Dormant there? I did, and imagine you were there with him and have no mind to own it. What should make you think so? A lady, masked in a deshabillé, whom Dormant entertained with more respect than the gallants do a common wizard. Dormant? At the play? Entertaining a mask? Oh, heavens. She has taken the bait. Um, um, did he stay all the while? Till the play was done and then led her out, which confirms me it was you. Traitor. Oh, now you may believe he had business, madam, and you may forgive him, too. Ungrateful, perjured man! You seem so much concerned, my dear. Perhaps I should have held my peace. What manner of shape had she? Hmm? Tall and slender, her motions very genteel. Certainly she must be some person of condition. Bitch! Alas! Your transports are too violent, my dear. This may be but an accidental gallantry and likely ended when he took her to her coach. But besides, madam, should the flirtation have proceeded farther, let your comfort be that Mr. Dormant cares not a fig for ruining ladies' reputations. So twill be not long ere you know the harlot's name and see her scorned, madam. Where she be, all the harm I wish her is. May she love him as well as I do, and may he give her as much cause to hate him. Madam, Mr. Dorimant. I will not see him. I told him you were within, madam. <sighs> Say you lied. Say I'm busy. Shut the door. Say anything. He's here, madam. Oh, pox on you all. I can't sit still. Fuck. Uh. Dancing the hay without a fiddle? I fear this restlessness of the body, madam, proceeds from an unquietness of the mind. What unlucky accident puts you out of humor? A chemise, ill-washed, rouge, spoiled in the making up, hair shaded awry, or some other little mistake in setting you in order? A trifle, in my opinion, sir, more inconsequential than any you mention. Oh, Mrs. Pert, I never knew you sullen enough to be silent. Come, let me know the business. Oh, oh, the business, sir, is the business that has taken you up these two days. I, business? Thou faithless, inhuman, barbarous man, tell me, for I will know. What devilish masked she were you with at the play yesterday? Faith, I resolved as much as you, but the devil was obstinate and would not tell me. False in this as in your vows to me. You do know. Well, the truth is I did all I could to know. <gasps> and dare you omit to my face? Oh, hell and furies! Spare your fan, madam. You are growing hot and we'll want it to cool you. <sighs> Horror and distraction seize you. Sorrow and remorse gnaw your soul and punish all your perjuries to me. Belinda. You are the devil that have raised this storm. You were at the play yesterday and have been making discoveries to your dear. You're the most mistaken man in the world. Nay, it must be so. And here I vow revenge, madam. Resolve to pursue and persecute you more impertinently than any ever loving fop did his mistress. I'll hunt you in the park, trace you in the mall, haunt you at the plays and in the drawing room, hang my nose in your neck and talk to you whether you will or no and ever look upon you with such dying eyes till your friends grow jealous of me, send you out of town and make the world suspect your reputation. Damned blistering Raquel! At uh, my lady Townley's, Belinda, when we go from hence. I'll meet you there. Nay, stand off. You should not stare upon her so. But tell me, tell me that masked harpy's name. God's my life. Is this the constancy you vowed? Constancy? At my years? 
uh, tis not a virtue in season, but you might as well expect the fruit, the autumn ripens in the spring. Dissembler, damned dissembler. I am so, I confess. Good nature and good manners corrupt me. I am honest in my inclination and would not seem as fond of a thing I am weary of as when I doted on it in earnest. False man. True woman. Now you begin to show yourself. I love gilds us over and makes us show fine things to one another for a time, but soon the gold wears off and then again the native brass appears. Think on your vows to me, cruel perjured man. Uh, I made them when I was in love. And therefore not, ought they not to bind? Ah, you mistake love for loyalty. Love tears the document. Loyalty signs on the line. I never swore you fealty, madam, nor plighted you any troth. Horn and ungrateful, be gone and never see me more. I shall obey you, madam, though I do myself some violence. Uh, come back. You shall not go. Could you have the ill nature to leave me? Oh, when love grows diseased, the best thing we can do is put it to a violent death. I cannot endure the torture of a lingering and consumptive passion. Can you think mine sickly? Oh, tis desperately <laughs> ill. What worse symptoms are there than your being always uneasy when I visit you? You're picking quarrels with me on slight occasions and, in my absence, drinking the libel of every fashionable fool that talks to you. What fashionable fool can you lay to my charge? Why, the very cock fool of all those fools, Sir Fopling Flutter. I, I never saw him in my life but once. The, wor the worst woman you, at first sight, to put on all your charms, to entertain him with that softness in your voice, that all wanton kindness in your eyes you so notoriously affect when you design a conquest? So damned a lie did never malice yet invent. Who told you this? No matter, fie, that ever I should love a woman that can dote on a senseless caper, a tawdry French ribbon and a formal cravat. This jealousy is a mere pretense, a cursed trick of your own devising. I know you. Believe it, and all the ill of me you can. I would not have a woman have the least good thought of me that can think well of foppling. Farewell. Fall to, and uh, much good may it do you with your coxcomb. Poisonous snake! Call him again. Pert, call him back, I say. Oh, he's gone, madam. Lightning blast him. I could tear myself in pieces. Revenge. Nothing but revenge can ease me now. Plague, war, famine, fire, all that can bring universal ruin and misery on mankind. With joy, I perish to have you in my power, but this moment. He's given me the proof which I desired of his love, but tis a proof of his ill nature too. I wish I had not seen him use her so. I sigh to think that dormant may be one day as faithless and unkind to me. Dear madam, let me set that curl in order. Let me alone. I'll sh I will shake them all out of order. Will you never leave this wildness? Torment me not. Look, there is a knot falling off. Oh, let it drop. Oh, but one pin, dear madam. How do I daily suffer under thy officious fingers? Ugh, the difference that is between you and my lady Dapper. How uneasy she is, if the least thing be amiss about her. She is indeed most exact. Nothing is ever wanting to make her ugliness remarkable. Poor deluded wench. That woman would should set up for beauty as much in spite of nature as some men have done for wit. I hope, without offense, one may endeavor to make oneself agreeable. Not when tis impossible. <laughs> Women dispossessed of beauty ought to be no more fond of dressing than fools of politics. We must all obey the motion of our sphere. Yesu! Madam, I warrant your mother will be impatient for you. For heaven's sakes, go in again. I won't. 
this is the extravagantest thing that ever you did in your life to leave her and a gentleman who is to be your husband. My husband? Hast thou so little wit to think I spoke what I meant when I overjoyed her in the country with a low curtsy and a, what you please, madam, shall I ever be obedient? Nay, I know not, you have so many intrigues. And this one was to get her up to London. Nothing else, I assure thee. Well, Mr. Belair, in my mind, is a very fine man. <laughs> He indeed wears his clothes fashionably, and has a pretty negligent way with him, very prim and courtly. I have never seen anything so genteel. Varnished over with good breeding, and many a blockhead makes a tolerable show. I wonder you do not like him. <laughs> I think I might come to endure him, and that is all a reasonable woman should expect in a husband. But I cannot love where I'm instructed, tis impossible. I partly guess your inclinations, madam, that Mr. Dormant. <laughs> Leave your prating and sing some foolish song or other. I will, madam, a love song in honor of Mr. Dormant. Sing a drinking song of whores and bottles. A pastoral serenade of kisses and rose petals. <laughs> I could cudgel you. Oh, but that would disagree with the melody. You mock my anger, but I am in the very bloom of my life. Shall I be paid down by a covetous parent for purchase? I need no land. No, I'll lay myself out all in love. It is decreed. What generous resolution are you making, madam? Only to be disobedient, sir. Let me join hands with you in that. With all my heart. I never thought I should have given you mine so willingly. <clears throat> Here I, Harriet Woodville. And I, Henry Belair. Do you solemnly protest. And vow. That I with you. And I with you. Will never marry. Will never marry. <laughs> A match. And no match. And for the sake of she that is all my soul, God say amen. You own then you are in love? I do. This confidence is generous. And in return, I could almost find in my heart to let you know my inclinations. Are you in love? Yes. With this dear town, London. <laughs> to that degree, I can scarce endure the country, even in simple paintings. What a dreadful thing twould be to be hurried back to Hampshire. Oh, name it not. Our only obstacle I see is the mutual design of our parents. Would we could do something to deceive the old idiots? Aha, what think you of playing it on booty? What do you mean? Pretend to be in love with one another. Let us do it, if but for the dear pleasure of dissembling. Can you play your part? I know not what tis to love, but I have made pretty observations by being now and then where lovers meet. Where did you leave their gravities? In the next room. Your mother was censuring the modern gallant. Ugh. Peace, here they come. I will lean against this wall and look bashfully down upon my fan while you, like an amorous spark, modishly entertain me. You must never go about to excuse them. Come, come, it was not so when I was a young woman. Um, a dog there, something disrespectful. Quality was then considered and not rallied by every leering fellow. Uh, use will have its jest, a dog it will. Tis good breeding now to be civil to none but actors and exchange women. They are treated by them as much above their condition as others are below theirs. Indeed, the rogues today have got an ill habit of preferring beauty no matter where they find it. Ah, see your son and my daughter. They have improved their acquaintance since they were within. A, a dogma thinks they have. Let's keep back and observe. Now for a look and gesture to persuade him, I am saying all the passionate things imaginable. 
your head a little more on one side. Ease your, yourself on your left leg and play with your right hand. Thus, is it not? <laughs> now smile and turn to me again, very sparkish. <clears throat> Upon my life, Henry Belair, you have a lovely smile. <laughs> I thank you, Harriet Woodville. Will you take your turn and be instructed? With all my heart. At one motion, play your fan. <laughs> Roll your eyes and then settle a kind look upon me. So. Now spread your fan. Look down upon it and tell this sticks with a finger. Very modish. And perfectly executed. I think I am pretty apt at these matters. Oh, I like this well. This promises something. Come, there is love in the cards for them. <laughs> or will be. Uh, what say you, young lady? <laughs> All in good time, sir. You expect we should fall to in love as Gamecocks fight as soon as we are set together? Dad, you're unreasonable. Ah, a dog, Sarah. I like thy wit well. <laughs> the coach is at the door, madam. Uh, go. Uh, get you and uh, take the air together. Will not you go with us? Uh, out of peace, I, I have business and cannot. We shall... Meet tonight at my sister Townley's. He's going to Amelia. I overheard him talk of a collation. Ugh. God help us all. I pity the young lovers we last talked of, though, to say truth, their conduct has been so indiscreet they deserve to be unfortunate. You've had an exact account, from the great lady in the box down to the little orange wench. You're a living libel, a breathing lampoon. I wonder you are not torn in pieces. I am a postman, Miss Amelia, and my apartment the Office of Intelligence. Dare you impugn a civil servant? But Linda, what has become of you? We have not seen you here of late with your friend, Mrs. Lovett. Dear creature, I left her but now so sadly afflicted. With her old distempered jealousy. Dormant has played her some new prank. Well, that Dormant is certainly the worst man breathing. I once thought so. And do you not think so still? No, indeed. The town does him a great deal of injury, and I will never believe what it says of a man I do not know again, for his sake. He's a very well-bred man. But strangely ill-natured. Then he's a very witty man. But a man of no principles. He has been the first in many ladies' favors, though you are so severe, madam. What he may be for a lover, I know not, but he's a very pleasant acquaintance, I am sure. Had you seen him use Mrs. Lovett as I have done, you would revile him. What, he has quarreled with her again? Upon the slightest occasion, he's jealous of Sir Fopling. She never saw him in her life but yesterday, and that was here. On my conscience, he's the only man in town that's her aversion. How horribly out of humor she was all the while he talked to her. Yet somebody has wickedly told him <laughs> that he comes. Dormant, you are luckily come to justify yourself. Here's a lady who would- Has a word or two to say to you from a disconsolate person. Ooh, you tender your reputation too much, I know, madam, to whisper with me before this good company. You serve Mrs. Lovett, I'll make a bold venture. Is something you are unwilling to hear, Mr. Dormant? Tell him, Belinda, whether he will or no. Mrs. Lovett told no, me- Softly. These are laughers, you do not know them. In a word, you've made me hate you, which I thought you never could have done. In obeying your commands? 
Twas a cruel part you played. How could you act it? Nothing is cruel to a man who could kill himself to please you. Remember, five o'clock tomorrow morning. Tremble when you name it. Be sure you come. I shall not. Swear you will. I dare not. Swear, I say. By my life, by all the happiness I hope for, I'm not gonna... I will. Hmm. Kind. Helpless. <laughs> In what temper did you leave Love It? Raving and denouncing you. Where have you been since you went from thence? I uh, looked in at the play. I have promised and must return to her again. Mm. Persuade her to walk in the mall this evening. She hates the place and will not come. Do all you can to prevail with her. For what purpose? Sir Fopling will be here anon. I'll prepare him to set upon her there before me. <laughs> you persecute her too much. <laughs> but? But I'll do all you'll have me. Dear Belinda, are you leaving us so soon? I am to go to the park with Mrs. Lovett, madam. This confidence with Lovett will go nigh to spoil the young creature. Nay, it will do her good, madam. Young men who are brought up under practicing lawyers prove the abler counsel when they come to be called to the bar themselves. The town has been very favorable to you this afternoon, my lady Townley. You used to have a congestion of chairs and coaches at your door, an uproar of footmen in your hall, and a noise of fools above. Indeed, my house is the general rendezvous, and next to the playhouse is the common refuge of all the young, idle people. Sir Fopling Flutter, madam, desires if you are to be seen. Here's the freshest fool in town, and one who has not cloyed you yet. Desire him to walk up. Do not fall on him, Medley, and snub him. Soothe him up in his extravagance. He will show all the more amusing. You know I have a natural indulgence for fools, and need not this caution, sir. Page, what was that? <clears throat> Madam, I kiss your ends. I see yesterday was nothing of chance as the Bell's Assembly affirms themselves here every day. <laughs> Dorimon, let me embrace thee. Oh, without lying, I have not met with any of my acquaintance to retain so much of Paris as thou dost. Why, it is the very air thou hadst when the Marquis mistook thee in the Tuileries and cried, oh, Chevalier, and then begged thy pardon. Ah. I would fain wear in fashion as long as I can, sir. <gasps> Sorry, the man of wit and understand, sit down. A prissy, let, let's see and I be intimate. There's no living without making some good man, the confidant of our pleasures. But there is no man so improper for such a business as I am. Prissy, why hast thou so modest an opinion of thyself? Why, well, first, I could never keep a secret in my life. And second, there is no charm so infallibly makes me fall in love with a woman as my knowing a friend loves her. I would deal honestly with you, sir. Thy humor is very gallant, or let me perish. I knew a French count so like thee. <laughs> Wit, I perceive, has more power over you than beauty, Sir Fopling. Else you would not have let this lady stand so long neglected. Oh, a thousand pardons, madam. Some civilities do, of course, upon the meeting of a long absent friend, but the eclat of so much beauty, I confess, ought to have charmed me sooner. The brillant of such good language, sir, has much more power than the little beauty I can boast. Oh, very much. Is, is not said medley? The same, sir. Oh, forgive me, sir, in this amber of civility, I could not come to have you in my arms sooner. <laughs> uh, now, medley, have you taken notice of the calèche I brought over? Oh, yes, sir. It has quite another air than the English makes. This is easily known from an English tumbrel as a lawyer is from one of us. <laughs> really, there is a Bel Air in Kalish as well as men. But there are few so 
delicate enough to observe it. The world is generally very grossy here indeed. He's very fine. Extreme proper. What, this old thing? Uh, it is a paltry suit, ladies, only fit for a first impression and not worth your consideration. Mm, the pantaloon is very well mounted. Mm, the tassels are new and pretty. I never saw a coat better cut. It makes me show long-waisted and, and I think slender. That's the shape our ladies dote on. I hmm. dare say he wears nothing but originals from the most famous hands in Paris. You are in the right, madam. My clothes are my creatures. I make them to make my court to you ladies. The suit. The baroy. The garniture. Le gras. The shoes. Ah, piquant. The periwig. The chadreau. The gloves. Mmm, orangere. Oh, you know the smell, ladies. <laughs> uh, Dorimant, I could find in my art for an amusement to have a, a gallantry with some of our English ladies. Oh, tis a thing no less necessary to confirm the reputation of your wit than a duel will be to satisfy the town of your courage. Uh, here was a woman yesterday. Uh, 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 uh. Mrs. Lovett. You have named her. You cannot pitch on a better for your purpose. Prizzy, what is she? A person of quality, and one who has enough store of reputation to make the conquest considerable. Besides, I hear she likes you too. Mm, I thought she seemed so very uh, reserved and uneasy all the time I entertained her. She did not even compliment my clothes. Grimace and affectation, the sins of every woman unwillingly in love. You will see her in the mall tonight. I all the world will be in the mall tonight. I know the town, sir. <laughs> the, hey, Paige, uh, see that all my people be ready? Dorimand. Mm. Au revoir. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A fine metalled coxcomb. Brisk and insipid. Pert and dull. However you despise him, gentlemen, I'll lay my life he passes for a wit with many. That may be. We are not living in the age of good taste. Come, Medley. Your servant, ladies. Au revoir, as Sir Fopling says. My brother Belair will be here immediately. Ugh. Let's wait for him in the garden. <laughs> Go to, you are a rogue. I can't abide you. <laughs> Come along. And leave your mother, Lady Woodville? Twill look devious in me. No, she'll believe it a freak of mine and never blame your manners. If only your friend Dormant were here but now, that she might find me talking with him. Your mother does not know him, but dreads him, I hear, of all mankind. She concludes if he does but speak to a woman, she's undone and is on her knees every day to pray heaven defend me from him. You do not apprehend him as she does. I never saw anything in him that was frightful. On the contrary, have you not observed something delightful in his wit and person? He's agreeable, I must own, but he does so much affect being so. He, dis he displeases me. I never heard him accused of affectation before. Tis because men have no ability to discern it, but she who cannot detect the posture of a determined libertine is not a well-born lady who will long boast the reputation of one. Oh, tis she. It must be she. The transcendent loveliness Medley spoke of. I'll follow the lottery and put in with a prize with my friend Harry. Hmm. Most people prefer Hyde Park to this place. It has the better reputation, I guess, but I abominate the dull diversions there. The formal bows, the affected smiles, the silly by words and amorous tears in passing. Here at St. James, one meets with a little conversation now and then. 
These conversations have been fatal to some of your sex, madam. It may be so, but just because some who want temper have been undone by gaming, must others who have it wholly deny themselves the pleasure of play? Uh, trust me, it were unreasonable, madam. Lord, who is this? Dormant. Oh! Harry, is this the woman your father would have you marry? It is. Mm. Her name? Harriet. If I am not mistaken, she's handsome. Talk to her. Her wit is better than her face. Mm. We were wishing for you, but now. Oh. Over Overcast with seriousness all of the sudden. A thousand smiles were shining in that face, but now I never saw so quick a change of weather. I feel as great a change within, but he shall never know it. You were talking of play, madam. Pray, uh, what may be your stint? <laughs> a little harmless discourse in public walks, or at most an innocent, barefaced conversation at the playhouse. Whereas you are for masks and private meetings where women engage for all they are worth, I hear. I have been used to deep play, but I can make one at small game when I like my gamester well. And be so unconcerned you'll take no pleasure in it? Well, where there is a considerable sum to be won, I'll play any game with all my might. <clears throat> the sordidness of men's natures, I know, makes them willing to be flatter and comply with the rich, though they are sure never to be the better for them. It is in their power to do us good, and we play their game in the hope at some time or other that they may be willing to confer rich favors upon us. To men who have fared on this town like you, to be a great mortification to live on hope. Hmm. Could you keep a Lent for mistress? In expectation of a happy Easter. And though time be very precious, I think 40 days well lost to gain your favor. Mr. Belair, let us walk. Tis time to leave him. Men grow dull when they begin to be particular. Oh, you're mistaken. Flattery will not ensue though I know you're greedy of the praises of the whole mall. You do me wrong. Oh, I do not. As I approached you, I saw how you were pleased when the fops cried, she's handsome, very handsome, by God she is, and whispered aloud your name. Ooh, and the thousand several smiles you put your face into to make yourself more agreeable. I do not go begging the men as you do the ladies good liking with a sly softness in your looks and a gentle slowness in your bows as you pass by him. You have observed me well. To better, the better to find out your faults. Oh, is that the reason? Your mother, madam. Ah, oh, my dear child. Harriet, come away. Tis now but high mall, madam, the most entertaining time of all the evening. I would fain see that dormant mother you cry out for a monster. He's in the mall, I hear. Ah, come away then. The man's a plague and you should dread the infection. You may be misinformed of the gentleman. Oh no, I hope you do not know him, Mr. Belair. Dormant is the prince of all the devils in the town and delights and nothing but women and wine. Uh, if you did but hear him speak, madam. Uh, uh, he has a tongue, they say, would tempt the angels to a second fall. What ho, Dorimont? Dorimont, where? Here among the rout? Egad, he names him. Come away, Harriet, come away. This Fool's coming has spoiled all. She's gone, but she has left a pleasing image of herself behind that wanders in my soul. Must not settle there. What reverie is this? <laughs> Speak, man. <clears throat> uh, no, sir, I beg your pardon. I uh, have no French about me at the moment. Dormant, a discovery. I met with Bel Air in the park. He is walking with- The Woodville ladies. I know all. How do you like the daughter? Yeah. 
you never came so near the truth in your life as you did in her description. Did her mother know you? Uh, not at the first. Whether she does now or no, I know not. Here was a pleasant scene towards when in came Sir Fopling, naming me and frighting her away. Mrs. Lovett and Belinda are not far off. <sighs> Excellent. Sir Fopling, a word. Oh, let it be amity, dear Dorimant, for friendship is the happiest word of life. <laughs> the time has come for you to make your advantage of what I have told you. At the next turn, you will meet Mrs. Lovett. Hey, day. Now I think on the more is as good a word as amity, so it is. <laughs> Go, sir, get you in a position. Medley, you shall see good sport anon between Lovett and this fopling. By your lady, I'm glad to hear it. Unless to see good sport, why should I ever leave my bedchamber? Oh, you know Lovett's worthy principle? Not to be so much as civil to a man who speaks to her in the presence of him she professes to love. <laughs> so I have encouraged Fopling to talk to her tonight. And since you are here, she will chastise him to kingdom come. Oh, very pretty in faith. But what was Belinda's business with you at my Lady Townley's? <sighs> to get me to meet Lovett here in order to disprove some lingering feelings she suspects me of harboring for the lady. See, here they come. Oh. Mm -hmm. How respectfully Dormant bowed to you. Uh, he's always overmannerly when he has done a mischief. I was afraid you would have spoke to him, my dear. <laughs> I would have died first. He shall no more find me the loving fool he has done. You love him still. No. I wish you did not. I do not, and will have you think so. Ugh, what made you hail me to this odious place, Belinda? I hate to be hulched up in a coach. Walking is much better. Would we could meet Sir Fopling now. Lord, would you not avoid him? No, faith, I would seduce him backwards in front. That would confirm Dorman's suspicion, my dear. <laughs> he is not jealous, but I will make him so, and thus be revenged. Nay, this will certainly make him hate you. The easier to fan into a passion, my dear. I know the effect of jealousy on men of his proud temper. It ignites them. Madam. <gasps> Sir Fopling! The <sighs> honor of kissing your fair ends is a happiness I missed this afternoon at my Lady Townley's. Oh, you were very obliging, Sir Fopling, the uh, last time I saw you there. <laughs> the preference was due to your wit and the beauty. Oh, Madam Brenda, your servant. Belinda. Well, charmed, eyes are way. There never was so sweet an evening. It has drawn all the rabble of the town hither. Mm, yes, this pity there's not an order made that none but the Beaumont should walk here. Mm, Twould add much to the beauty of the place. See what a sort of nasty fellows are coming. <gasps> They're engaged. She entertains him as if she liked him. Let us go forward and show ourselves. Then you shall see how she'll use him. Here comes Dormant in that spirit of scandal, Mr. Medley. Come to witness my cruelty, but I'll disappoint him. <laughs> I like this pretty nice humor of yours, Sir Fopling. With what a loathing eye you look upon the gross fellows who haunt them all. I know a fool from a farthingale, madam, and can give him a withering stare when occasion presents. I, look you now, see how I, I glower. Oh, well, any woman should be fortunate to, uh, to such a gaze at her side, Sir Fopling, that she might avoid conversation with those insidious fops that run themselves through every crack in London and serve only to clog up civilized conversation. A plague of all fops, madam. I defy them and I spit upon them, also I dare not do it here for fear of staining your dress. Love it takes no notice of you. Damn her, I am jealous of a counterplot. Uh, your liveries are the finest, Sir Fopling. 
And that page of yours, oh, that page is the prettiest dressed. They are all Frenchmen? Mm, there's one damned English blockhead among them. You'll know him by his stature. Oh, oh, that's he, that's he. What do you call him? Hey, they, I know not what to call him. You, sir, what's your name? John Trot, madam. Oh, oh, unsufferable, a trot? Trot, a trot. Uh, there's nothing so barbarous as the names of our English servants. Uh, what, uh, what countrymen are you, Sarah? Yorkshire, sir. Then Yorkshire be your name. Hey, Yorkshire! <laughs> oh, <laughs> that sound, it just becomes the mouth of a man of quality. <laughs> the wench dissembles better than I thought she could have done. You have tempted her with too luscious a bait. She bites at the coxcomb. She cannot fall from loving me to that. You begin to be jealous in earnest. Of one I do not love. You did love her. The fit has long been over. But I have known men fall into dangerous relapses when they have found their sometime woman inclining to another. I, he guesses the secret of my heart. I am concerned, but dare not show it lest Belinda should mistrust all I have done to gain her. I have watched his look and find no alteration there. Did he love her? Some signs of jealousy would have appeared. <clears throat> I hope this happy evening, madam, has reconciled you to the scandalous mall. <laughs> we shall have you now hankering here again. Sir Fopling, will you walk? I am all obeisant. That's obedience, you know, madam. I, I have a petite affinity for the French. Oh. She ignores you, Dormant. Uh, well, come along then, monsieur, and let's agree to be malicious on all the ill-fashioned things we meet. <laughs> oh, we we'll make a critique of the whole mall, madam. Oh, Belinda, come along. I require a chaperone, for I'm sure I won't trust myself alone with this <laughs> unparalleled exemplar of mm, manhood. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> oh, would you had brought some more of your friends, Dormant, to have been witnesses to Sir Fopling's disgrace and your triumph. <laughs> Were unreasonable to desire you not to laugh at me, but pray do not expose me to town for a day or two. By that time, you hope to have regained your credit. Oh, I know she hates Fopling and only makes use of him in hope to work me on again because she still loves me. You are nettled. Not in the slightest. Here comes a man from young Bel Air with news of your last adventure. <clears throat> Sir, my master desires you to come to my Lady Townley's presently and bring Mr. Medley with you. My Lady Woodville and her daughter are there. Then all's well, Dormant. Yes, they have sent for the fiddles and mean to dance. And he bid me tell you, sir, the old lady does not not know you. And there is a young mistress who would have you own your name to be Mr. Cortage. They are all prepared to receive you by that name. <laughs> Portage, the foppish admirer of quality who flatters the very neat at honorable tables and never offers love to a woman below a lady grandmother. You know the character you are to act, I see. Yeah, this is Harriet's contrivance. Wild, witty, lovesome, beautiful, and young. Come along, Medley. This new woman would well supply the loss of love it. No, oh, that business must not end thus. Before tomorrow's sun is set, I will revenge and clear it. And you and love it to her cost shall find. I fathom all the depths of womankind. <laughs> so, so, a smart bout, a very smart bout, a 
How do you like Emilia's dancing, oh, brother? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Speak not what you think, I am sure. Uh, uh, no matter for that. Uh, go. Bid her dance no more. It don't become her. It don't become her. Tell her I say so. <laughs> uh, Don, I love her. All people mingle nowadays, madam, and in public places, women of quality have the least respect. Show them, tis utterly disgraceful. I protest you say the truth, Mr. Cortage. Traditions and ceremonies are now shamefully laid aside and neglected. Aye, this is not the women's age. Lewdness is the business now. <laughs> Love was the business in my time. Well, the women indeed are little beholding to the young men of this age, but they're generally only dull admirers of themselves and make court to nothing but their periwigs and their cravats. You have hit upon it, good Mr. Cortage. He fits my mother's humor so well. A little more and she'll dance a kissing dance with him anon. <laughs> now that I should like to see. The men of today pretend to be great critics in beauty. Uh, by their talk, you would think they liked no face and yet can dote on an ill one if it belonged to a laundress or a tailor's daughter or an actress. <gasps> Reprehensible word. And what's worse, madam, they cry a woman's past her prime at 20, decayed at four and 20, and insufferable at 30. Insufferable at 30. That they are in the wrong, Mr. Cortage. Indeed they are, Lady Woodville, for here I have sitting before me substantial proof that a woman of quality blossoms only the more with every passing year. I protest, Mr. Cortage, a dozen such good men as you would be enough to atone for that wicked dormant and all the libertines of the town. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter there? <clears throat> Nothing, mother. Come, come, we keep the musicians idle. They are impatient till the fiddles play again. You are very active, sir. No, oh, well, Dodd, sir, when I was a young fellow, I could have capered my way into a woman's garter. <laughs> no more garters, father. I beseech you. Hey, you're a prudish fellow, a Dodd you are. He gets it from his mother, Miss Amelia, my late wife, you know. <laughs> Not from me, I assure you. <laughs> oh, good. You are willing to rest yourself, madam? Let us walk into my chamber and sit down. Excellent notion. <laughs> Yet send him out again and quickly, mother. If you do not, I know where to send for Mr. Dormant. This girl's head, Mr. Cortage, is mm. ever running on that wild fellow. Tis well you have got her a good husband, madam. That will settle it. A dog, sweetheart, be advised, and do not throw thyself away on a young, idle fellow. I have no such intention, sir. Have a little patience. Thou shalt have the man I spake of. A dog, he loves thee, and will make a good husband. Uh, but no word. But, sir, you cannot S simply say... <sighs> no, uh, no answer. A Daughter rogue, peace, and think on it. Uh, your company is desired within, sir. I go, I go, good Mr. Cortage. Fare you well, sweeting. I shall see you anon. You have charms for the whole family, dormant. What, a mother and a daughter, too? Beware of greed, tis a deadly sin. Indeed, Mr. Dormant, methinks my Lady Woodville is a little fond of you. Would her daughter were? It may be you find her so. Try her, you have an opportunity. I'll withdraw with the lovers, who, as I understand it, have some secret plans to unfold. 
That we do, Mr. Medley. Get you the part, then. That demure little curtsy is not amiss in jest, but do not think in earnest it becomes you. Affectation is catching, I find. I was infected by your grave bow. Where got you all that scorn and coldness in your look? From nature, sir. Pardon my want of art. I have not learned those softnesses and languishings, which now in faces are so much in fashion. Well, you need them not. You have a sweetness of your own. If you would but calm your frowns and let it settle. My eyes are wild and wandering like my passions and cannot yet be tied to rules of charming. Nay, put on a gentle smile and let me see how well it will become you. I am sorry my face does not please you as it is, but I shall not be complacent and change it for your sake. My face, Mr. Dormant, as my will is entirely my own. Well, though you are obstinate, I know it is capable of improvement. My face or my will? Both, if I be fortunate. Mm, neither if you be impudent. <laughs> is it impudence to implore one kind look, madam, that my love might engage? <gasps> you make me start. I did not think to have heard the word love from you. I never knew what was to have a settled ague yet, but now and then have had irregular fits. Take heed. Sickness, sickness after long health is commonly more violent and dangerous. Uh, I have taken the infection from you, madam, and indeed feel the disease spreading in me. Is the name of love so frightful that you dare not stand it? No. I dare say the word from your mouth will do no execution upon me. Well, it has been fatal to You uh, sound easy, woman. But we are not all born to one destiny. I was informed you used to laugh at love and make it everywhere, but feel it not. The time has been. But now I must speak. If it be that. on that idle subject, I will put on my serious look, turn my head carelessly from you, and answer never a word. <laughs> Why do you not begin? That our company may not take notice how passionately I make advances of love and how disdainfully you receive them. When your love's grown strong enough to make you bear being laughed at, I'll give you leave to trouble me with it. Till then, Mr. Cordage, pray keep it to yourself. Oh, what's here, masqueraders? And dressed in a whirligig of colors. <sighs> This must be Sir Fopling. That extraordinary habit shows it. And with his army of French footmen in tow, we must endeavor to make him reveal himself. A fool is very troublesome when he presumes he is incognito. Do you know me, lady? 10 to one, but I can guess correctly. Are you women as fond of a bizarre as we men are? I am very fond of a vazard that covers a face I do not like, sir. Here are no masks you see, sir, but those which came with you. This was intended to be a private meeting, but because you look like a gentleman, if you discover yourself and we know you to be such, you shall be welcome. Dear Ari, tis me! <laughs> sir Fopling, miracle of miracles, how came you hither? A face. I was coming late from Whitehall after the king's coucher. Uh, one of my people told me he had heard fiddles at my lady Townley's, and you need not say any more, sir. Dorimond, Dorimond, let me kiss thee. Ah. Oh, 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 oh! I mean, I mean, I mean, Mister Cortage. Uh, <laughs> a pretty kind of young woman there, Medley. I observed her in the mall. More Eva is than our English women commonly are. Prissy, what is she? The most notorious coquette in town. Beware of her. May I let her be what she will. I know how to take my measures. In Paris, the mode is to flatter the prude, laugh at the faux prude, make serious love to the demi prude, and only rally with the coquette. Eh? Medley? What think you? That for all this smattering of mathematics, you must be a devil of a tennis player. 
what the cocaine line is this? Is that a strange fellow, Monsieur Le Popari? <laughs> I talk of women and they'll answer tennis. <laughs> oh, but oh, a Doriman. Yeah. Oh, oh, damn, Mr. Cortage, I would say. Could thou had spent the last winter in Paris with me? And no stranger ever passed his time so well as I did in the months before I came back to London. I tell you, sir, I was received in a dozen families where all the women of quality used to visit. I have intrigues. I could tell you in mille fois plus more pleasant than I've ever read in a novel. I want to write him down, <laughs> sir. Nay. Get you home. Pick up a quill and write every intrigue in detail. It would be an excellent use of your time. <sighs> Writing, madam, is a mechanic part of wit. A gentleman should never go beyond this song or a billet. <laughs> Sir, I would give anything to hear one of your songs anon. Oh. Oh, in good time, dear sweet Ari, the music is never far off with me. Oh, a Doriman. Again! Uh, uh, cortege, I pox on it. I have something to tell thee. When I made my court within, I came out and flung myself into the outward room in the midst of half a dozen beauties who were jeering among themselves, as they called it. Did you know them? Not one of them by Evans, not I, but they were all your friends. How are you sure of that? Why, we laughed at all the town, spared nobody but yourself. They found me a man for their purpose. I have, as you know, gentlemen, a most irrepressible wit. We are extremely aware of the character of your wit, sir. Uh, you learned who the women were? Mm, no matter. They frequent the drawing room, uh, but they all thought you quite handsome and, and quite the, the terriblest man. Handsome and terrible, Cortage. Your reputation precedes you. What are these masqueraders that stand so obsequiously at a distance? A set of baladins whom I picked out of the very best in France and brought over with a flute deuce or two. Huh? My servants. They are my servants. They shall entertain you. Restrew me, but I am mightily taken with this fool. Surely not. What? A handsome, terrible, and jealous Mr. Cordage. Come, Sir Fopling, come sit by me. At your feet, madam. <laughs> bon Dieu, I can be nowhere so much at ease. And yet I had better sit between you, lest his giddy humor wrinkle your gown. Oof. Oh, my daughter, what have we here? A mumming? Where's my daughter? Harriet? Uh, here, here, madam. I believe under these disguises there may be dangerous sparks. I gave your daughter warning. Lord, I am so obliged to you, Mr. Cortage. Lord, mother, the man is a fop. Let him be anything but a dormant, that wild, extravagant fellow of the times. Indeed, my dear, Mr. Cortage is so good a man that were you not engaged to Mr. Belair, we should no doubt this very day be wishing you joy, Mrs. Harriet Cottage. <laughs> the hour's almost come, I appointed Belinda, and I am not so foolishly in love here to forget. I am flesh and blood yet. Medley, distract the hens. Mm. Uh, do you not know Sir Fopling, madam? I have seen him, Mr. Medley. Who can miss those garish colors? Oh, heaven, is that he? The very same. Preternatural coxcomb, how came he here? Uh, a fiddle in this town is a kind of fop call. No sooner it strikes up, but the house is besieged with an army of masqueraders straight. Lord, I tremble, Mr. Cortage, for certainly Dormant is in their company. I cannot confidently say he is not. Uh, you had best be gone, madam. Oh, sage advice, sir. Harriet, come away. I'll uh, attend you, madam. <clears throat> now, uh, tell me, sir, what, what mumming spark is that? He is not to be comprehended in few words. Hey, Pidge. Whither away, Sir Fopling? I have business with 
Mr. Cortage. He's putting the ladies into their coaches and will be here again. In the meantime, I'll call for a bottle of wine. Tis good after dancing. <clears throat> Where's Dormant? Stolen home. He has had business waiting for him there all this night, I believe by an impatience I observed in him. Very likely, sir. And that business will have dark hair and burning eyes, or I know him not. Uh, pox on it, I must speak with him before I sleep. There is a fine lady whose wooing he has promised to assist me in. Um, but now, Medley, let me tell you, Emilia and I are resolved on our business. Peace. Here's your father. The women are all gone to bed. Mr. Medley, here's a glass for thee. Begin a health, man. To Emilia. Medley. <laughs> How to peas. <laughs> She's a rogue. <laughs> I'll not abide her. <laughs> I know you will. Aye, <laughs> aye, man, I will. Abide her and abate her. <laughs> <sighs> but come, uh, let's drink. Hey, Benj, uh, let us have the new bashik. No, Dot, that's a hard word. Uh, what does it mean, sir? He means a catch or drinking song. I, I, a, a drinking song, a song whilst we drink. Uh, Dot? <coughs> a pretty business. And uh, very merry. Arq, Medley, let's, let's you and I take the fiddles and go wake in Dorimont. <laughs> we shall do him a courtesy, as I guess, for after the fatigue of his pleasures in the night, He'll quickly have his belly full and be glad of an occasion to cry, take away the mistress, Handy. I'll go with you both, and there we'll consult our affairs, Madley. No, oh, a dog to six o'clock. Uh, let's away then. Uh, hey, Benj, I like the flambeau. What does the man mean? Tis day, Sir Fopling. Eh, no matter. Come away, garçons. My life, a very good party. <laughs> Why will you be gone so soon? Why did you stay out so late? Call a chair, Handy. <sighs> what makes you tremble so? I have a thousand fears about me. Have I not been seen, think you? By nobody but myself and trusty <laughs> Handy. What does that sigh mean? Can you be so unkind to ask me? Well, were it to do again? We should do it, should we not? I think we should. The wickeder man you to make me love so well. Will you be discreet now? I will. You cannot. Never doubt it. I will not expect it. You do me wrong. <laughs> You have no more power to keep the secret than I had not to trust you with it. Mm, by all the joys I have had and those you keep in store. You'll do for my sake what you never did before. Huh. And what's that? Promise. Swear on my life that you will never see Mrs. Lovett again, but in public places, in the park, at court, and the playhouse. Yeah, tis not likely a man should be fond of seeing a damned old play when there is a new one acted. Hmm, this does not satisfy me. You must swear you never will see her more. I do. A thousand oaths by all the stars. No. You shall not, now I think on it better. I will swear. But I shall grow jealous of the vow and think I owe your constancy to that, not to your love. Ooh, then by my love, no other oath I'll swear. Here's a chair, sir. Let me go, <laughs> sir. Oh, I cannot. When will <laughs> you promise me again? Not this fortnight. <laughs> you will be better than your word. I think I shall. <laughs> Will it not make you love me less? You, uh, what? What? What the? <laughs> Hark! What fiddle 
rules are these? Find out, Handy. Mr. Medley, Mr. Belair, and Sir Fopling, sir. They are coming up. How the devil got they in? The door was open for the chair. Lord, let me fly. Here, here, down the back stairs. I'll see you to your chair. No, no, stay and receive them. And be sure you keep your word and never see Mrs. Lovett again. Let it be a proof of your kindness. It shall. Handy, direct her. Everlasting love go along with thee. What? Not a bed yet. You have been plagued by some fit, Dormant? I have. And has it ended? No, it is here in the room with me. We thought there was a wench stepping into the chair that waited? Uh, Prizzy, make us a confidence. Not for a thousand Parises. Ah, uh, Lesage, Dormant. <laughs> oh, was she pretty? So pretty, she may come to change her father's name for a prosperous husband's if I protect her Christian one. But pray, why fiddles, gentlemen? You do not like the music. Not at seven o'clock in the morning. Brizzy Dorimont, uh, why hast thou not a mirror hung up in here? A room is the dullest thing without one. Here is company to entertain you. But, but I, I mean in case of being alone. In a glass, a man may entertain himself. The shadow of himself, indeed. But pray, Sir Fopling, how goes your business with Love It? Pfft, you might have answered yourself in the mall last night. Oh, Dorimont, did not you see the advances she made to me? I have been endeavoring at a new song. Already? Mm, this might go to sign in English. I have a natural ear. Tis the only natural thing about him. Mm. Oh, oh, Le Fleur, is my bath ready? Oui, monsieur. Oh. Adieu donc, mes chers. I have at home hot water and perfumery awaiting me. <gasps> Heaven forbid we should stand between a man and his bath water. Go to! When have you your revenge on Lovett, Dormant? I will but change my linen in about it. And you must along with me. My reputation lies at stake there. I'm engaged to Bel Air. Why? What's your business? Matrimony, and it like you. It does not, sir. It may in time, Dormant. What think you of Miss Harriet? Uh, hmm. What does she think of me? I am confident she loves you. How does it appear? Why, she's never well but when she's talking of you, but then she finds all the faults in you she can. She laughs at all who commend you, but then she speaks ill of all who do not. Women of her temper betray themselves by their over-cunning. You are pleased. I'm interested. My father is in love with Amelia. <laughs> There's a good warrant for your proceedings. Go on and prosper, Harry. I must to Mrs. Lovett. You had best not think of Harriet Woodville too much. Without um, church security, I dare say there's no taking up there. Yeah, I may fall into the snare too. But the wise will find a difference in our fate. You are a woman, I a good estate. Lord, where am I? In the mall? Whither have you brought me? You gave us no directions, madam, but we used to carry a lady from the master's hither. <sighs> Mrs. Lovett, no doubt. Pox, and here comes one of her servants now. I am undone if she discovers me. Quickly, sir, carry me away. <laughs> Whither, and it like your honor. Ask no questions. <sighs> Have you seen my lady, madam? I am just come to wait upon her. She will be so glad to see you, madam. She sent me to you this morning to desire your company, and I was told you went out by five o'clock? More and more unlucky. 
Will you walk in, madam? I'll discharge my chair and follow. Tell your mistress I am here. <laughs> Take this. And if ever you should be examined, be sure you say you took me up to the exchange as you will answer it to Mr. Dormant. We will, and I like your honor. Now to come off, I must on. In confidence and lies, some hope is left. T'were hard to be found out in first theft. Well, in my eyes, madam, Sir Popling is no such despicable person. You are an excellent judge. <laughs> He's as handsome a man as Mr. Dormant, and as great a gallant. Intolerable! Is it not enough I submit to his impertinences? I must be plagued with yours, too. <sighs> Miss Belinda, madam. Oh, whatever. She's below. How came she? In a chair. Um, Aimbling Stephen brought her. Stephen? Stephen bring her. <gasps> his chair stands near Dormant's door and always brought me from thence. Run and ask him where he took her up. Go! <sighs> then there is no truth in friendship, neither. Women are as false as men, or at least so to me. You are jealous of Belinda, too? Why should I not be? This fellow's bringing of her, her going out by five o'clock in the morning? I don't know what to think. <sighs> Belinda, you are grown an early riser, I hear. Do you not wonder, my dear, what made me abroad so soon? I do wonder, madam. The country gentlewomen I told you of, Lord, they have the oddest diversions, <laughs> would never let me rest till I promised to go with them to the markets this morning to eat fruit and buy nosegays. Mm. Are they so fond of a filthy nosegay? They complain of the stinks of the town and are never well, but when they have their noses in one for myself, I beg their pardon and told them I never wore anything but orange flowers and tube rows. That which made me willing to go was a strange desire. I had to eat some fresh nectarines. Mm. And had you any? The best I ever tasted. Whence came you now? From their lodgings where I crowded out of a coach and took a chair to come see you, my dear. Whither did you send for that chair? Twas going by, empty. Where do these country gentlewomen lodge, I pray? In the Strand, over against the exchange. Hmm, do they so? Um, <clears throat> come hither. Alas. This fellow by her order has been questioning Dorman's chairman. If they should have told truth, I am lost forever. In the Strand, you say? Uh, yes, madam, over against the exchange. God, she's innocent then, and I am much to blame. And yet I am so frighted my countenance will betray me. But Linda, what makes you look so pale? Want of my usual rest, my dear, and jolting up and down in a Odious hackney, no more. Mr. Dorivant, madam. What? What? <laughs> Dorivant? Christ! What makes him here? Then I am betrayed indeed. He's broke his word, and I love a man that does not care for me. Lord, you faint, Belinda. I, I think I shall. Such a fit, my dear. Belinda has eaten too much fruit, I warned you. Mm, not unlikely. That which lies heavy on her stomach. Mm. Tattling rogue. We'll have her brought into my chamber, pert, and let her lie down a little. Come, madam. This way. Oh, oh, but my love would be but calm a while, that I might receive this man with all the scorn and indignation he deserves. Hmm. Now for a, a touch of surfopling to begin with. Eh! Hey, bash! 
Give positive orders that none of my people stir. Let the can I wait as they should do? Since noise and nonsense have such powerful charms, I, that I may successful prove, transform myself to what you love. If that would do, you need not change from what you are. You can be vain and loud enough for 20 foplings. But not with so good a grace, madam. Is there a thing so hateful as a senseless mimic? I have as mean an opinion of a sheer mimic as yourself, yet I should prefer the tasteless actor to the gay, giddy, brisk, insipid, noisy fool you dote on. Those noisy fools, however you despise them, have good qualities which weigh more with us women than all the pernicious wit you have to boast of. Good qualities? Pray, name them. First, they really admire us, while you libertines at best but flatter us well. Ooh, take heed, fools can dissemble too. But not so artificially as you. There is no fear they should deceive us. Then they are assiduous, sir. They are ever offering us their service and always <laughs> waiting on our will. You owe that to their excessive idleness. They know not how to entertain themselves at home, so they fly to you, who endure them as a refuge against a solitude they would otherwise be condemned to. Their conversation is more diverting. Oh, I playing with your fan, sniffling at your gloves, commending your hair, and taking notice how to cut and shade it after the new fashion? They invite us into their humor rather than subjecting us to be the target of it. Pray, explain yourself. You must allow tis pleasanter to laugh at others than to be laughed at oneself. I never laugh at you. Not when I'm present, I grant you. But the moment my back is turned. Vile conjecture! Gross knowledge! Oh. Then? Though fools want the necessary skill to flatter us, they flatter themselves so well that they save us the labor. They commonly indeed believe too well of themselves and always better of you than you deserve. Why then, tis little wonder that vanity should corrupt the reasoning of a woman so misguided in the premise of her own catechism. <gasps> I? Misguided? Yes, madam, for you mistake the use of fools. They are designed for properties, not for friends. You have a measly stock of reputation yet. Would you lose it all like a careless gamester on red? The old and ill-favored are only fit for properties indeed, but young and handsome fools have met with kinder fortunes. <laughs> they have, to the shame of your sex. Ah. Twas the thought of this made me by... A uh, loving jealousy, endeavor to prevent the good fortune you are preparing for Sir Fopling Flutter. But against a woman's frailty, all our care is in vain. Had I not with the cruel experience bought the understanding of your falsehood, you might have fooled me yet. This is not the first jealousy you have feigned to make a quarrel with me and so get a week to throw away on some unknown, inconsiderable select as you have lately been lurking with at the playhouse. Ah, yes, very good. See, women, when they would break off with a man, never want for an occasion to turn the fault on him. You take pride in using me ill that you may boast to the town of the power you have over me, and yet now they expect, as unreasonably as you, that I must forgive all and love you still. I am so far from expecting that you should, I begin to think you never did love me. Would the memory of your love were not so fresh that I might doubt it too. Why did you come here? to give you joy of your growing infamy. Insupportable, insulting devil. This from you, the only author of my shame? What have I done? A thing that puts you below my scorn to so nauseous and ill-advised. Uh, I walked last night with Sir Fopling. <laughs> you did, madam, and you talked too and laughed aloud. <laughs> oh, that laugh, that laugh becomes the confidence of a woman of quality. You who have more pleasure in the ruin of a woman's reputation than in the endearments of her love, reproach me not. I will reproach you, madam, to be seen publicly so transported with the vain follies of that notorious fop is to me in infamy below the sin of prostitution with another man. Rail on. 
I am satisfied in the justice of what I did. Twas you provoked me to it. What I did was the effect of a passion whose extravagances you have been willing to forgive. And what I did was the effect of a passion you may forgive if you think fit. Are you so indifferent grown? I am. Nay, then, tis time to part. Stay. I will not. You shall. You will have something more to say in commendation of the fool. Death. I want patience. Let me go. I, I hate that nauseous fool. You know I do. Was it the scandal you were fond of then? You raised my anger equal to my love. A thing you ne'er could do before. And in, re in revenge, I did... Oh, I know not what I did. What you would, you would not think on it anymore. Should I be willing to forget it, I shall be daily reminded of it. It will be the food of common gossip for all the town to laugh at me. And, and Medley, when he is drunk, will be ever declaiming it on my ears. <sighs> Twill be believed a jealous spite. Pray, forget it. Let me consult my reputation. You are too careless of it. Oh. You shall meet Sir Fopling in the mall again tonight. What mean you? I have thought on it, and you must. It is necessary to justify my love to the world. And you can handle a coxcomb as he deserves when you are not out of humor, madam. This is some new device to make me more ridiculous. Hear me. I will not! You will be persuaded. Never! Are you so obstinate? Are you so base? You will not satisfy my love! I would die to satisfy that! But I will not to save you from the railleries of your friends and lewd companions by doing a shameless thing to please your vanity! Farewell, false woman! Do! Go! You will call me back again! Exquisite fiend! I knew you came but to torment me! <laughs> ah, Belinda here. He starts and looks pale. The sight of me has touched his guilty soul. Alas, tis your bad fortune, Belinda, ever to be here when I am abused by this prodigy of ill nature. Bad fortune indeed, my dear. How has he the nerve to come near you? There is no remedy. I must away and with all possible speed. Other men are wicked, but then they have some sense of shame. This, Doramint, on the other hand, is never well, but when he triumphs, nay, glories to a woman's face of all his villainies. You have reproached me handsomely, madam, and I deserve it for coming hither, but you must- You must expect it, sir. Oh, all women will hate you for my lady's sake. Fie, impertinent. I'm not so guilty as you imagine. I shall seek a more convenient time to clear myself. Do it now! What impediments are here? I want time and you want temper. These are weak pretenses. You were never more mistaken in your life. And so, farewell. Quickly, I will have him followed. I wish you would not, for my quiet and your own. Ah, oh, find out the infamous cause of all our quarrels. Pluck off her mask and expose her barefaced to the world. Belinda, you shall go with me. Uh, alas, I have such a heaviness hangs on me with what I did this morning. I would fain go home and sleep, my dear. Death and eternal darkness. I shall never sleep again. Raging fever, seize the world and make mankind as restless all as I am. I knew him false and helped to make him so. Was not her ruin enough to frighten me from the danger? It should have been, but love can take no warning. Bear up, Belair. 
And do not let us see that repentance in thine we daily do in the faces of married men. This wedding will strangely surprise my brother when he knows it. Your nephew ought to conceal it for a time, madam, since by all accounts that institution marriage has lost its good name. I beg your pardon, sir. Nay, be not censorious, young parson smirk. I have been the Lord Scourge and damned to hell since before the first whiskers sprouted on your chin. You gain nothing but my irritation by endeavoring to save my soul. Where are you all there? Out of Doddle, nobody here. My brother, quickly, Mr. Smirk, into the closet. You must not be seen yet. Oh, <laughs> where have you been, Harry? You could not wait on me today. About a business, sir. Oh, are you so good at business? <laughs> Dodd, I have a business too. Usual dispatch out of hand, sir. Send for parson, sister. My lady would a daughter are coming. It is time to give the young people. What need have you, brother, on this particular day to hurry forth the ceremony? Now to appease youth is apt to play the fool. Aye, but you need not fear your son. Oh, he's been idling all this morning, and a dot I do not like him. <sighs> oh, but how does thou today, sweetheart? You are very severe, sir, to have your only son married in such haste. Go, go to thou art a rogue, and I'll talk with thee anon. <sighs> ah, uh, here's my Lady Woodville come. Welcome, madam. Mr. Forbes is below with the writings. Let us down and make an end, then. Uh, sister, show the way. <gasps> Mr. Medley, we must hmm. uh, trouble you to be a witness. I luckily came for that purpose, sir. What will you do, madam? Run away, I think or be carried back and mute up in the country again. Anything rather than be married to a man I do not love. Dear Amelia, do thou advise me? You know Mr. Belair has no desire to entrap you. I do, but know not what the fear of losing his inheritance may fret him to. In the desperate condition you are in, you should consult with some judicious man. What think you of Mr. Dormant? I do not think of him at all. She thinks of nothing else, I am sure. How fond your mother was of Mr. Cortage. Because I contrived the mistake to make a little mirth, you believe I like the man? Mr. Blair believes you love him. Men are seldom in the right when they guess at a woman's mind. Mr. Dormant has a great deal of wit and takes a great deal of pains to show it. Ooh, he's extremely well-fashioned. Affectedly grave and ridiculously wild. You defend him still against your mother? I would not were he just railed at, but I cannot hear anyone undeservedly railed at. Let us test your resolve then, for here he comes. My love springs with my blood into my face. I dare not look upon him yet. What have we here? The picture of celebrated beauty giving audience in public to a declared lover? Play the dying fop and make the performance complete, sir. Hmm. What think you if the hint were well improved, the whole mystery of making love could be pleasantly designed and wrought in an elegant theater backdrop? But the theater is so unserviceable to one dissatisfied with life. All is false and nothing is permanent. For instance, twere needless to execute fools in effigy who suffer daily in their own persons. A, a palpable hit, madam. Thank heaven I am not a fool. I give you joy, Mrs. Bride, for such I know this happy day has made you. Defer that joy until the truth comes out and mind your business with Harriet. Here are dreadful preparations, Mr. Dormant. Writing, sailing, and a parson sent for. Uh, 
uh, to marry this lady? I, to Henry Belair, sir, condemned is she and what will become of her, I know not. Unless you generously engage in a rescue? In this sad condition, madam, I can do no less than offer you my service. And where do I rank in the number of your rescue damsels, Mr. Dormand? <sighs> Am I the third? The tenth? Pray God I'm not the twentieth. You cannot refute me, for I know you are the common sanctuary for all young women who run from their relations. I have always my arms open to receive the distressed. But I will open my heart and receive you where none yet did ever enter. You've filled it with a secret. Might I but let you know it. Do not speak it if you would have me believe it. Your tongue is so famed for falsehood to do the truth and injury. Then look on me and guess it. Did you not tell me there was no credit to be given to faces? That men and women nowadays have their passions as much at will as they do their complexions and put on joy and sadness, scorn and kindness with the same ease they do their paints and patches? Is it not every face in our world, none but a counterfeit, a mumming mask we wear to disguise what we would not have known and guard all our truths from those who make us weak enough to imagine we might faithfully tell them? Yes, madam. But truth is a restless passion to allow whether we like it or no. By all the hope I have in you, the inimitable color in your cheeks is not more free from art than are the sighs I offer. In men who have been long hardened in sin, we ladies have reason to mistrust the first signs of repentance. The prospect of such a heaven will make me persevere to prove I am in earnest. How, sir? I will re renounce all the joys I have in friendship and in wine. Sacrifice to you all the interest I have in other women. Hold! <laughs> Though I wish you devout, I would not have you turn fanatic. Could you neglect these pleasures a while and make a journey into the country? To be with you, I could live there and never send one thought to London. When I hear you talk thus in Hampshire, I shall begin to think there may be some truth enlarged upon it. That's this all. I'll be in Hampshire tomorrow. Will you not promise me, madam? I that... hate to promise. It makes life an expected thing, and I would only live to be surprised. May I not hope? That depends on you and not on me. But I suppose there's no purpose to forbid it. Faith, madam, now I perceive the gentleman loves you too. Let him know your mind and then torment yourselves no longer. <laughs> Does think I have no sense of modesty? Think, madam, that if you lose this, you may never have another opportunity. Well, what have you resolved, dear Harriet? The time draws near. To be obstinate and protest against this marriage. Please, madam. Quickly, quickly, Amelia. Let Mr. Smirk out of the closet. What? <sighs> A parson? <sighs> Stumbling Machiavel, had you laid him in there? Well, I knew nothing of him. He did not, dear Harriet. I can vouch it. But why a parson? Why stashed away? Truly, madam, I wish I could satisfy you with an answer. Christ, my bones ache. Oh, to peace. The canonical hour is almost past. Sister, is the man of God come? He waits your leisure. By your favor, sir. Oh. A doctor, pretty spruce fellow. <laughs> what may we call him? Mr. Smirk, sir, my Lady Gormley's chaplain. No, mm, a wise woman, a dog she is. By our lady, this man will serve the flesh as well as the spirit. <laughs> um, please you, sir, to commission a young couple to go to bed together in God's name. <laughs> Harry? Here, sir. Out of peace without my mistress in your hand. Is this the gentleman, sir? Yes, sir. You're not mistaken, sir? A uh, daughter, I think not, sir. Sure you are, sir. The boy's my son, sir. I'd know him anywhere. I'm sure you would, sir. 
You, you look as if you would forbid the bans, Mr. Smirk. I hope you have no objection to the lady. None, sir. I wish him joy of her, sir. I have done your son the good office today already, sir. Out of peace. <laughs> My son married? What do I hear? Never storm, brother. The truth is out. Can't say you, sir. Is this your wedding day? It is, sir. Then a dot, it shall be mine too. Give me thy hand, sweetheart. Ugh! Nay, what dost thou mean? Give me, give me thy hand, I say. Come, come, give her your blessing. This is the woman your son loved and is married to. Huh? Cheated? Cousined? Uh, and by your contrivance, sister? Why, what would you do with Emilia? She's a rogue and you can't abide her. Nor abed her neither. Uh, Dodd, you are all rogues and I will never forgive you. Whither? Whither away? Let him go and cool a while. Here's a business broke out now, Mr. Cortage. I am made a fine fool of, and my daughter nicely scorned. Oh, you see, the old gentleman knows nothing of it. I suspect he did. I am sure I ha shall have some trick put upon me if I stay in this wicked town any longer. Harriet, dear child, where art thou? I'll into the country straight. Uh, uh, Dodd, madam, you, you shall hear me first. <sighs> Hither my man dogged him. Yonder he stands, my dear. <gasps> oh, I see him. Oh, and with the face that has undone me. Oh, that I were, but where I might throw out the anguish of my heart. Here it must rage within and break it. <sighs> what, it? what, my dear? Are, are you afraid to come forward? I was amazed to see so much company here in a morning. <laughs> the occasion must be extraordinary. Love it. And Belinda? Huh. The devil owes me a shame today, and I think never will have done paying it. Married? Dear Amelia, how I am transported with the news. I little thought Amelia was the woman Mr. Belair was in love with. I'll chide her for not trusting me with the secret. How do you like Mrs. Lovett? She's a famed mistress of yours, I hear. She has been, on occasion. Then we are resolved, good madam. You need make no more apologies, sir. <sighs> Using himself to my Lady Woodville. <laughs> I never heard of anything so pleasant. <laughs> He's extremely overjoyed at something. <gasps> Mr. Dormant, are oh. you a bridegroom? Mr. Dormant? Oh, God. Is this Mr. Dormant, madam? If you doubt it, your daughter can resolve you, I suppose. <clears throat> then I am cheated, too. Basely cheated. Out of peace. What, what, what's here? More knavery yet? Harriet, on my blessing, come away, I charge you. Dear mother, do but stay and hear me. I am betrayed, and thou art undone, I fear. Do not fear it. I have not, nor never will do anything against my duty. Believe me, dear mother, do. I had trusted you with this secret, but that I knew the violence of your nature would ruin my fortune, as now unluckily it has. I thank you, madam. She's an heiress, I know, and very rich. Mm -hmm. To satisfy you, I must give up my interest wholly to my love. Had you been a reasonable woman, I might have secured them both and been happy. You might have trusted me with anything of this kind. You know you might. Why did you go under a wrong name? The story is too long to tell now. Be satisfied, this is the business. This is the mask has kept me from you. He's tender of my honor, though he's cruel to my love. Was it no idle mistress then? Believe me, a wife. 
to repair the ruins of my estate that needs it. Uh, the knowledge of this makes my grief hang lighter on my soul, but I shall never more be happy. Melinda! Do not think of clearing yourself with me. It is impossible. Do all men break their vows thus? Eh, it is as unreasonable to expect we should perform all we promise when we are fired with love as we do all we threaten when we are angry. When I see you next... Take no notice of me, and I shall not hate you. But we must meet again. Never. Never? When we do, may I be as infamous as you are false. Mm. Men of Mr. Dorman's character always suffer in the general opinion of the world. You can make no judgment of a witty man from common fame, considering the prevailing faction, madam. No, Dodd, he's, he's in the right. Believe me, Lady Woodville, you will find Mr. Dormant as civil a gentleman as you thought, Mr. Cortage. If you would but know him better, you would see- You that have a mind to know him better. Come away. You shall never see him more. Dear mother, stay. I won't consent to your ruin. I see what you would be at. You would marry this dormant. I cannot deny it. I would, and will never marry any other man. Is this the obedience you promised? Yes, for I will never marry him against your will. Uh, alas, she knows the way to melt my heart. <sighs> Upon yourself then, daughter, light your undoing. Come, sir. You have not the heart any longer to refuse your blessing. <sighs> My daughter, I, I have not. <sighs> Rise and oh, God bless you both. Make much of her, Harry. She, she deserves thy kindness. And God, Sarah, I did not think such deception had been in thee. I am a duplicitous rogue, sir. A dot I am. And my wife. Praise be. Ha, praise be! <laughs> hey, this a damned windy day, eh, Pedge? Uh, is my periwig right? A little out of order. Is that mm, the box of this apartment, it wants an antechamber to adjust oneself in? Ah. I came from your house, and your servants directed me either. I will give order hereafter, they shall direct you better. The great satisfaction I had in the mall last night has given me much disquiet since. Tis likely to give me more than I desire. What the devil makes her so reserved? Am I guilty of an indiscretion, madam? You will be of a great one if you continue your mistake, sir. Something puts you out of humor? The most foolish, inconsiderable thing that ever did. Is it in my power? To hang or drown it. Do one of them and trouble me no more. So, fear. Sir Victor, madam. Medley, where is Dorimond? Mm, methinks the lady has not made you those advances today she did last night, Sir Fopling. Brizzy, do not talk of her. It would make me weary, and I must reserve all my strength for a dance I will shortly perform that shall rekindle her affection for me. Wisely considered, Sir Fopling. And no one woman is worth the loss of a cut caper. Lay mo to live by. Mr. Dormant, everyone has spoke so much in your behalf that I can no longer doubt, but... I was in the wrong. <sighs> There's nothing but falsehood and impertinence in this world. All men are either villains or fools. Take example from my misfortunes, Belinda. If thou wouldst be happy, give thyself wholly up to goodness. Nay, swallow your own advice, madam. Mr. Dorman has been your god almighty long enough. Tis time to look for another. Cheered oh, by her. I will lock myself up in my house, madam, and never see the world again. 
a nunnery is the more fashionable place for such a retreat and has been fatal to con and has been a fatal consequence of many belle passion. Hold heart till I get home. Should I answer, it would make her triumph greater. <clears throat> Your cue, Sir Fablin. Oh, shall I wait upon you, madam? Legion of fools, as many devils, take thee! Is dark mad by all that is handsome, uh, Dorimont? Thou hast engaged me in a pretty business. I have not leisure now to talk about it. Out of peas, what does this man of moan here again? He'll be an excellent entertainment within, brother, and is luckily come to raise the mirth of the whole company. Madam, I take my leave of you. What do you mean, madam? To go this afternoon, part of my way to Hampshire. I thought you shall stay and dine first. Come, uh, we, we will all be good friends, and you shall give Mr. Dormant leave to wait upon you and your daughter in the country. If his occasion bring him that way, I have now so good an opinion of him that he shall be welcome. To a great rambling lone house, that looks as if it were not inhabited, the family so small, Mr. Dormant. There you'll find my mother, a creaky old aunt, and myself, sir, perched up on chairs at a distance in a large parlor, sitting, moping, like three melancholy birds in a spacious volary. Does not this dagger your resolution? Not at all, madam. The first time I saw you, you left me with the pangs of love upon me, and this day my soul has quite given up her liberty. Wish me courage, Amelia, for I fear I shall shortly make a faithful quest to join thee in the kingdom of matrimony. Be strong, dear friend, and do not for one second let that dormant forget to whom he owes his love and loyalty. Sister, knowing of this matter, I hope you provided us some good cheer. I have, brother. And the fiddles, too. Let them strike up, then. Let them strike up, then. The young lady shall have a dance before she departs. And then we'll in and make this an arid wedding day. And if these honest gentlemen rejoice, the dog, the boy has made a happy choice. <laughs> well done, everyone. Let's give everyone some virtual applause. Amazing, you guys.